Hey, hello everybody. Welcome to the North Downey Church of Christ. If you didn't know that by now, well, now you know it's North Downey Church of Christ. If you ever wondered how to get here, if you're not, if you are from out of town, we're just off the five freeway. Sounds like a car dealer. Yeah. We're off the five freeway. Go north on uh, Lakewood Rosemead. Come to Telegraph Road. Turn right or left, depending on it's probably turn right. And one block, turn right again on Lindell Street, and voila, we are there. It looks like a bank building or something like that. But we're behind. So look, yes, buy Peppies, and you can stop and get a taco or something there. And we have that great big sign. You can see our sign says Church of Christ. So it shouldn't be a problem in finding us. But you are welcome to come this Sunday morning um, at uh, nine at ten o'clock. If you want to come at nine o'clock, we have a Bible class, right? So we're studying through Psalms, and I think you'll enjoy doing that. We're looking forward to probably doing a little different in our study down the road and coming up. Uh, we're looking at possibly going through the book of Isaiah, so you could do that as well. But anyway, come and see us. But in the meantime, I hope you are doing well. The weather is great here in Southern California. We are in the middle of spring, and um, that's about it. Got stuff in the air to breathe so we can get our allergies going and, and all of that. Uh, and in terms of news, we, have, we were able to contact and find Dennis. Um, got a phone number so we were able to get a hold of him and we're happy about that i th i think um did we hear anything about lafania that she that they we were finished with the treatment or uh, our, the uh, other treatment they're starting a, a, the different the radiation. treatment the radiation treatment so they're going to start the radiation treatment with lafania so uh just keep praying for her that that this would work out well, I'm sure it is. Just keep uh, keep praying for her, keep her up in our in our prayers. And Teresa, we want to remember her in our prayers as well as she deals with the various challenges in her life, the losses that she's endured, as well as her own uh, struggle with illness. Uh, and Oscar. Uh, and Oscar, yeah, we haven't seen Oscar in quite a while, and most of you know he's. He's struggling with dementia, and so, and I believe that he's in a facility somewhere, so we keep him in our prayers. He has been a member here for a long, long time, uh, but now he's over in this facility, so we want to remember him in our prayers as well. And um, all the people at the border. All the people at the border, and those poor kids that they keep, they drop over the fence, and they're in these facilities now, and. Um, now we hear that they're being sexually assaulted, I don't know, by assault, by staff, or by other kids. I mean, it's, they're just, they, they um, I think these, oh, these, uh, what do you call it, the coyotes, they, they just have no heart. They're just bringing them over and dropping them there, and uh, they have no place to put them. They're just bunching them into these facilities, and we heard that now they're looking at other facilities, like uh, Long Beach or the convention center, that they may put thousands of kids over there and a few other places so it's it's a it's a tragic situation we want to keep all these uh, situations in our prayer of course uh, china and the problems that they're going through the genocide that they're committing there not only against the christians but also i think they're called the uyghurs uh, Uyghur. Uyghurs. Uyghur. uyghurs yeah but it starts with the u the uyghurs we want to keep them in our prayers lots of things going on and of course we mentioned what's going on in our congregation and as I say, you're welcome to come join us. Well, anyway, we're going to have a word of prayer. And then we're going to be in the book of Acts. And we will be in I, chapter 25. I did list it as 25 and 26. I think I was being ambitious. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Uh, but we'll be in 25 and 26 today, hopefully, or get through 25. You're welcome to bring any Bible you have. You're welcome to invite a friend, family member, and have them sit down with you. And you can bribe them with a cookie or something like that. So say, I'll give you more if you'll sit through all of this. <laughs> see, see what it's like, right? If you sit through this, and don't use it as punishment, okay? All right, well, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are, um, well, we're grateful, God, for... The, the many blessings that you've sent our way, the, the amazing way that you've treated us and, and you've given us life, you've given us, uh, uh, we've given us opportunity to live in this country as well and the freedom that at least we have for now to, to read your Bible, to discuss it, to meet like this. And, uh, 
And so, and we thank you for that, Father, for our daily blessings, the fact that we can even breathe, that our hearts are beating. All these things we attribute to you, Father, because you are the one who has given us all these things. And so we thank you for that, God. And, uh, and of course, Father, the, um, we're told to rejoice always at all times, no matter in season, out season, that we're able to rejoice before you. And even to, to appreciate the time of testing, though we don't like it at times, but we do appreciate it as it is your plan to, to help us to grow in your, in your sight. And Father, we think about the people we've mentioned, uh, whether it's Dennis or LaFania or Teresa and Oscar and some of our others, uh, Georgina, some other people that we have in our, our congregation and those that we know, the gentleman uh, whose house was burned up in that uh, fireworks explosion a few weeks ago. We, we think about him and his family. And all these, Father, you, you are well aware of these concerns we know because there are other people who have prayed to you about and you are aware of as God. And of course, the international situation with these uh, these migrants who have been brought over the, the children, uh, ripped away from their parents, and now having to be scrunched together in these facilities that are only made for a few hundred. Now they have thousands of these young people in there, as well as the, the swarm at the border. We know that there are, many are escaping the problems in their own country, but we also know that there's only so much room on the boat. We, we pray God for wisdom and guidance, uh, for those individuals who are working and, and trying to uh, control this issue, and for those children as well. And we pray for the many people who are being uh, persecuted throughout the world, uh, whether it's in China or in Africa and other places uh, in the Middle East. And uh, many of those people are Christians. Many of those people do not know anything about the Lord, but they're being persecuted and attacked and things like this. We pray for them as well. We pray, God, that you would give protection as well as to change the, the heart of the leadership in those countries that they may turn and repent and see you. We know that's the only way that um, good things can happen. Guide us, Father, in our Bible study. May we grow because of it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are in, uh, as I said earlier, Acts chapter 25. Now, it's been an amazing journey for the Apostle Paul. Oh, oh. I'm just so tied up in this joke time. I know I, because I know our, our vast audience out there waits for this moment. Okay, so, okay. Um, why did I say that one? Let me see. Uh, notice the because of break up some hard. No, no, that won't work. Uh, I, I think that won't work. Okay. Oh yeah, here's one. <clears throat> My grandpa would always tell me that when he was growing up, his mother would give him a dollar and send him to the store and he'd come back with two loaves of bread, half a gallon of milk, a carton of eggs, and a pound of pork. He says you can't do that nowadays. There are way too many security cameras. <laughs> um, why didn't the dog want to wrestle? Answer, he was a boxer. Okay, how about that? Okay, okay, let's see here. <laughs> no, we got approval here. Um, let me see. Um, let's see what? Okay. No, just Dion. Okay, knock, knock. Who's there? Dion. Dion who? I'm Dion the face of thirst here. Know that? Dion the face. Dion. Dying of thirst here. Um, what's the boxer's favorite part of a joke? The punchline. And how... <laughs> <laughs> How quiet should a bowling alley be? You should be able to hear a pin drop. Okay, well, I know you're waiting for that. Calm down, it's okay. Ooh, take a deep breath. I'm just laughing so much. Okay, so now we're here. Thank you for, to Mary who remind me. We, got, we can't forget our jokes. Okay, we're in chapter 25 of Acts. You might recall... Um, this is a very interesting situation where the Apostle Paul, of course, he was, he was transferred to Caesarea because uh, he had learned of a plot to kill him way back in Jerusalem. And so now he's, he's gone up there and he appears before the governor, Felix. Now, as we said, Felix, not Felix the cat, but Felix was there, right? And so... Uh, he was watching over things and he was a governor. And so you say, what's a governor do at the time you think about 
Pilate was a governor, a procreator, and so uh, he was doing his job, and now Felix takes over from there. So he's running things. And of course, there was another person before him, but he's running things. So they brought this issue up to, to Felix. It was really a religious issue. He's scratching his head about this, and he's like, I don't understand what's going on. But it was interesting enough that, um, that Paul was speaking with him uh, throughout the time. And at one point, uh, he said, um, you know, not now, right? I don't have time for this. Uh, he says, uh, go away uh, for now until I have a more convenient time to call for you. It's basically the reason many people give anyway was that. I don't oh, look at the time. Don't have any time to talk to you about the Lord. And that's what he did. But it was interesting, as you would, we would read in chapter 24 of Acts, that, that Felix kept coming back and having conversations with Paul and no doubt hinting because he was hoping that Paul would give him a bribe uh, to get out. And uh, it shows how smart Felix was or how dumb he was that he would ask money from a preacher. And how, how are you going to get money out of him? And so um, he's there for two years, as it tells us in the last verse of Acts 20, 24. Uh, he, he says, after two years, Porcius uh, Festus succeeded Felix, and Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, left Paul bound. Some of you may wonder, what about Festus? And um, some of you might recall, whenever I think of the, of the name Festus, I think of the actor Ken Curtis, who played Festus Hagen on Gunsmoke. You're going to see his picture here in just a moment if you haven't seen it already. So, uh, so whenever I see, when I, ever, I read about, does anyone remember Festus Hagen from Gunsmoke? Yeah. Marshall Dillon. <laughs> so uh, he's, I think about him when I read this. But anyway, Festus is the new governor. So I'm going to go ahead and read here from verse 1 to, um, how about verse, uh, verse 9 of uh, chapter 25 of Acts 25. Chapter 25, Acts 20, right? Verse 1 through 9, this is what it says. Now when Festus had come to the providence, province, after three days he went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem. Then the uh, high priests and the chief men of the Jews informed him against Paul, and they petitioned him, asking a favor against him, that he would summon him, Paul, to Jerusalem while they lay in am ambush along the road to kill him. Uh, but Festus answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea and that he himself was going there shortly. Therefore, he said, let those who have authority among you go down with me and accuse this man to see if there is any fault in him. And when he had remained them, uh, he remained among them, I should say, uh, for more than 10 days, he went to, down to Caesarea and the next day, sitting on the judgment seat, he commanded Paul to be brought. When he had come, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood about and laid many serious complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. While he answered for himself, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar have I offended in anything at all. But Festus, wanting to do the Jews a favor, answered Paul and said, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and there be judged before me concerning these things? And I'll read verse 10. So Paul said, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. To the Jews I've done no wrong, as you know very well. And he goes on. But anyway, may God bless this uh, to his uh, praise. Uh, title of our lesson is what? I forgot the title. <laughs> uh, yeah, almost persuaded. I'm sorry, I shouldn't know that. Almost persuaded, which is in the next chapter, but we'll see how this all works. So uh, here's Festus. He's, he's the new governor of the area. And um, so he's on a, like a goodwill trip. And remember, we, we mentioned this before, it, Jerusalem uh, amongst the Jew, and the Jews and that whole area, Judea, was a very difficult area to, to govern. Uh, no one really wanted to go there. We've said this before. The soldiers didn't want to go there and work um, and didn't want to serve there, but they went there because they're ordered. Governors didn't want to go there because they were just an unruly population and they had, uh, they had to do a lot of things. So he's going down there. He's, he's vidi he, he visited Jerusalem. He wants to get to know everybody. He says, introduce himself. I'm the new governor. 
And so the high priests and the chief men of the Jews, uh, these are the ones that Paul dealt with and they had, you know, they weren't liking what he said. And so they, they talked to him about Paul. They said, well, we, by the way, you know, we've got this guy, Paul, he is one of us, but now he's a traitor and he's done all these, we don't like him and, and um, we'd like you to bring him down. That's what he said. they said here in verse three. So they asked a favor against him that he would summon him to Jerusalem. He says, could you bring him down? We think this is a more proper place. Bring him down here so we can have a little hearing with him. And uh, they're all like going, uh, wink, wink, yeah, we can't wait. Because it says here, while they lay in wait in ambush along the road to kill him. See, they wanted to kill him before. So they had these guys, you might remember, there are 40 of them who made the, a blood promise basically to kill Paul you know, on, on the way out. And uh, so that's when the, the Roman commander said, no, no, not gonna happen. He had 400, over 400 soldiers to protect Paul, take him all the way to Caesarea, which is about a 35 mile walk. Um, and then, uh, you know, they, while he's there, he's been there for two years now. Uh, by the time we get to chapter 25, he's there for two years and they're still angry at him. The, the high priests, they still want to kill him. Man, holding a grudge. How long do you hold a grudge like that? My gosh. Yeah. So anyway, um, so Festus said, uh, no, no, not going to happen. Verse 4, he said, no, we're, we're going to keep him in Caesarea. Maybe someone kind of tipped him off to say, uh, you know, be careful about these folks. They want to kill him. And he says, I'm going to go up there myself, but I'm, we're going to keep him up there. But... He said, "If you know those of you you want to come up and accuse him, verse five, let those who have authority among you go down with me and accuse this man to see if there was any fault in him." By the way, uh, if you, when you look at the map, um, Caesarea is north of Jerusalem; it's not south of Jerusalem. So, you, I think we've mentioned this before. You wonder why do they keep saying? They're coming down from Jerusalem to go up to Caesarea. And the reason why is that Jerusalem's on a mountain area. So you're coming down the hill. But they also looked at Jerusalem as being the, the city above all cities. So if you're going anywhere, you're going down. It's sort of like saying, if you like L.A., you know, I'm coming down from L.A. somewhere. But if you don't like L.A., you know, it's already down. So anyway, that's another story. Um, so anyway, um, that's what they did. So they, they, he said, you know, bring your guys up there. You can make your accusations and all of that. So after 10 days, he makes his way up to Caesarea and uh, he's, he's on the judgment seat. First thing he does, he calls Paul, bring him in. So uh, he came in and there were the Jews out there waiting for him, the high priests and all this and the Pharisees or the Sadducees, Pharisees, maybe they're all out there and they're like making faces at him and all in our day it's called mad dogging. They're mad dogging <laughs> Paul, you know. And, uh, you know and, they're, and they start making serious complaints that they couldn't prove. It sounds like we heard a lot about that last year, didn't we? A lot or last couple, four years, you know, making serious complaints they couldn't prove like, Russia, 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 and all of that. But that's another story, right? They couldn't prove it. But there they were. They were saying they were saying this and that and making all these, but they couldn't prove it. And Festus is saying, you know, all right, where's your proof? And they said, well, you know, we just, uh, you know, they're going on and on. So now we come to verse 8. And, uh, and they, they turn to Paul. And this is what Paul says in verse 8. He says, well, neither against the law of the Jews nor against the temple nor against Caesar have I offended in anything at all. You see, that's, that was the main accusation that the Jews were making, these Jewish leaders were making against Paul. They said he was going against the, the law of the Jews, against Moses, you know, so he's breaking their religious laws, which to the Romans, they would say, well, so that doesn't mean anything to us. Nor, I, I, he says he hadn't done anything, done anything against the temple. And basically they remember they accused Paul of uh, profaning the temple because he, they think he brought a Gentile in with him, which he didn't. They made up that. And he says, I didn't do anything against the temple. And the more serious charge was that he says, I haven't done anything against Caesar. In other words, they, they thought he was kind of leading something against Caesar because if you say something like that, that perk their ears up and say, what, you're, you're, you're trying to fight Caesar? You're trying to you know, come after us? And so he says, I haven't done anything like this. I haven't offended in any of this. So Festus, he said, uh, well, 
he wants to do the Jews a favor. And he said, well, wouldn't you like to go up to Jerusalem, you know, and be judged with your own people? You know, come on, go down there. Paul said, no, no, no. <laughs> he said, I'm not going to do that. Paul says in verse 10, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. Uh, to the Jews, I've done no wrong, as you know very well. Do you want to remember why? Why did the Romans even get involved in this? Because of the riot that was going on um, at the temple. Everyone was, they wanted to pull Paul apart. And so they, they saw this as a possible guy. He was kind of, kind of a, uh, an instigator. And so they really had no charge against him. They just kind of held on to him. And, and that would probably be the only thing that he was trying to instigate a riot and maybe lead, uh, cause a riot or a rebellion against Caesar. That's really all they had on, not the religious thing. So uh, Paul, he's being smart about this, and he says, well, uh, okay, I'm over here in your court. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm to be judge. I haven't done anything with the Jews. That's a religious matter. So if I'm a an offender, verse 11, or I've uh, committed anything deserving of death, uh, I, I don't object to dying. Is it verse eleven? He says, you know, I don't. Okay, if I die, I die. But if there is nothing in these things of which men accuse me, no one can deliver me to them. He said, you don't have a right. See, he claimed his rights. You don't have a right to give me, hand me over to these people because there's nothing that I've done uh, that would be uh, earning of death. And so then he comes up with this zinger. After all that, he says, no one, no one should deliver me to him. He said, then he comes with the zinger. I appeal to Caesar. Once he said that, Festus's hands were tied. Festus said, uh, verse 12, when he had conferred with the council, he stops, he hears this, he goes to his council and to the Jews, no doubt, and he comes back, he says, well, and this was a hot potato for Festus. He says, okay, good. You've appealed to Caesar? To Caesar you shall go. So you're going off to Rome. So he got this fabulous, um, all expenses paid trip to, to Rome, Italy. Isn't that great? <laughs> and you know, on, the, on the Roman dime, you know, they're paying for it, right? So he's going to go to Caesar. So that's, that's the end. They, and the Jews are like, oh, and they're walking away. He has to go all the way to Rome, you know, and, and, and talk to Caesar, stand before Caesar. Now, Paul is like, yeah, this is what I want to do. He's, he's excited about this uh, because I'll get to preach the gospel over there. This is not, I, yeah. And I, you know, did God put that in his mind? Seems like all these things are leading up where he came to Jerusalem. There, everyone's saying, don't do this, don't do this. He goes there. One thing leads to another. And now here's his perfect opportunity to preach the gospel in Rome. And not only to preach the gospel in Rome, but to go to the head honcho, if you will, Caesar, and talk to him about Jesus Christ. It would be like someone talking to the president or anyone else or the leader of Russia or something like that to talk to him about Jesus. This is what made Paul so excited about it. Well, we have a little time left. And um, we, have a lot of time. we have a lot of time left. So now in the rest of the chapter here, um, there's a few days, everything's died down and everything. And now um, King Agrippa and his wife, his lovely wife, Bernice, <laughs> They come to Caesar to visit with Festus. Now, why are they doing this? Remember, Festus is the new guy in town. The king, who is kind of put in charge of things, he, he only operates under the authority of the Roman government, right? He's sort of like this honorary position, but he has power. And so, remember, we had king, um, uh, who was the king before him? Remember the king that died? I can't think of the... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, the king that they had before him. Who was the other king that they had that they before went before Agrippa? Yeah, before Agrippa. I'm, uh, I, I'm trying. I'm drawing a blank on him. Well, you hold on. We'll get there. I'm drawing a blank on the king that. Uh, the <laughs> anyway, he's. Why can't I think about this guy? Anyway, he was a. Remember, he was a guy who came in and um, he had. I'm getting. I'm turning a Biden. I'm turning into Biden. <laughs> Marlon? No, no, no. Forget it. We'll get we'll get to him. Herod, 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 Herod. Okay, Herod. Who was Agrippa too? Well, Agrippa, yeah, but he's part of that so group. So was Herod two or Agrippa one? Yeah. So you, you, yeah, the the uh, sequel. 
Yeah, but anyway, Agrippa takes over, so he's the king. I was going to say here, but I'll see. That's too easy. <laughs> it's too easy. It's supposed to be some name I don't know. Woo! Okay, anyway, here's the... <laughs> Man, so here, even preachers forget. Okay, so here's Agrippa. And uh, so he's under the authority of Rome. He, he operates only because Rome gives him this power. And so the Herod dynasty, they're the ones who built the temple uh, in this massive thing in Jerusalem. And so they had power. The people really didn't like the Herods because they're, you know, they, were, they just exercised raw power. So anyway, here's Agrippa. Is that the same Herod as did with uh, John the Baptist? Yes, yeah. Well, not the the same family, the same family. So it's like, a, like popes. Yeah. They changed their name, like Pope John Paul for a second, third, fourth. Yeah. They all had Herod because Herod goes all the way back to baby Jesus time. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. So you, you had that Herod and then you have another Herod coming up. And now remember that last Herod that died because he was... He was in the stadium and, everyone said, and he would speak and everyone said, oh, the voice of a God. And he says, yes, that's true. And in front of the eagle, ah. He had worms. And he had worms. Always, you know, if you ever worry about getting worms, go to the vet. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, here they are. Here's, here's Agrippa and he brings his wife. And so they come to meet Festus, verse 14. When they had been there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, there's a certain man left a prisoner by Felix. He's, he says, you know, he wants a conversation piece. So he's, he's talking to, Festa, to, uh, to Agrippa, and he says, hey, I got something I want to tell you about this guy. Maybe you know about him. And he says, uh, verse 15, about whom the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me, verse 15, when I was in Jerusalem asking for a judgment against him. To them I answered, it is not the custom of the Romans to deliver any man to destruction, in other words, a death penalty, before the accused meets the accusers face to face and has opportunity and to answer for himself concerning the charge against him. Isn't that something? Uh, the accused always has a right to face his accuser. You realize that's in our law. And that's interesting uh, how American law, we derive many things from the Bible, but also from ancient Rome. There's a lot of things that Rome t has taught about citizenship and, and uh, you know, the right to face your accusers. Are, that's part of American law. So they just couldn't just kill him or execute him just because of what these people said. Paul had a right to face his accusers. So he said, this is why I brought these people together. So verse 17, therefore, when they had come together without any delay, the next day I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought in. And when the accusers stood up, they brought no accusation against him of such things as I suppose. In other words, he said, what I heard from them uh, was nothing. I, I, like, they're like, what's to your charges? So, so um, uh, verse 19, but they had some questions against him about their own religion about, and about a certain Jesus. He, this way he says about this guy named Jesus, right? Who had died and whom Paul affirmed to be alive. He's, he knew nothing about this religion. Festus knew something about it. I, uh, yeah, not Festus, but uh, yeah, uh, Agrippa, I'm sorry, knew something about this. But Festus didn't know much of it. He said, well, I don't know, it's about this guy named Jesus. And he, he was killed, and now he, Paul says he's alive. And that eh, doesn't make much sense to me, right? And so verse 20 says, and because I was uncertain of such questions, I asked whether he is willing to go to Jerusalem and there be judged according to these matters. But when Paul appealed to be reserved for the decision of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept till I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to uh, Festus, he said, hmm, you know, I, I, I would like to hear the man in my, himself. Why? Because Agrippa, you know, he, he has to know a lot of things that are happening in the Jews. And he has to know a lot of things about this Jesus. Remember, Jesus appeared before um, Herod before he was killed, right? And of course, Herod tried to wipe out the church and wipe out Christianity by, uh, he tried to kill Peter and all of this. And you know what that happened, Peter got loose. And so all these things happened. So Agrippa is no, is no dummy. He knows about this stuff. And he says, you know, I, I, I wanna hear about this man. I wanna, and tomorrow, uh, you know, he's, I wanna hear him. So here Festus said, okay, uh, tomorrow you shall hear him. So verse 23, so then, and this is interesting. We get in this interesting scene. 
So the next day, verse 23, when Agrippa and Bernice had come with great pomp or pageantry and had entered the auditorium with the commanders and the prominent men of the city at Festus's command, Paul was brought in. Now you just got to picture this. <coughs> And now presenting His Majesty, King Agrippa, and his lovely wife, the Queen Bernice. Da, 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 da. And he's walking in, and there's a lot of pomp and circumstance, and everyone standing says, oh, the king, the king. And uh, I mean, it says the commanders. Uh, he, he came in with the commanders and the prominent men of the city. So they're kind of ahead of him. They're all going. And then the king comes. Yeah, king. You know, his entourage. His entourage. He comes in and he's going, yeah, that's right. And he just, this is the picture. So he comes in. This is a big event. This isn't just a little, one little thing. There were lots of people there. Here's the king. Here's Festus. Here's the uh, king's wife. Here's the commanders, and here's the audience. And so, as I said, it was in an auditorium. So this is a big deal. So Festus said, uh, you know, bring in Paul. So Festus said, and then Festus stands up and he makes this speech. This is a speech that we're hearing, okay? Uh, that, because he already told the king about him. But he stands up and he says, King Agrippa, you know, he does his, uh, um, and all the men who are here present with us, you see this man about whom the whole assembly of the Jews petitioned me both at Jerusalem and here, crying out that he was not fit to live any longer. But when I found out that he had committed nothing deserving of death and that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I decided to send him. I have nothing certain to write to my Lord concerning him. Therefore, I have brought him out before you and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the examination has taken place, I may have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable to send a prisoner and not specify charges. Again. This is a show. And he says, I don't know what to write about this man. King Agrippa, he knew what to write, right? But he wanted Agrippa because he's his guest. So anyway, then, then we get into chapter 26. We've got a little time, right? So here's, yeah, we've only been recording half hour. Okay, we've got a half hour. So. Here he is, uh, Agrippa says to Paul. So this is actually, they shouldn't break this up into 25, but it should be all one chapter. So Agrippa says to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. You know, he's, you know, he's a king, right? So Paul, very, this is characteristic of Paul, stretches out his hand. This is almost like a, a gesture of how they speak. So he, Paul had been trained in public. So stretches out his hand and answered for himself. And then this is what Paul says. And, and you can imagine, Paul was dressed up for this. They didn't bring him in dirty. I'm sure they cleaned him up, put nice clothes on him. There's a, this audience out there. This, I mean, this is incredible. He has this chance to talk about Jesus in front of him, right? So he, he opens up and you can see this, hear this dramatic moment in your mind. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you, concerning all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. Isn't that nice? Butter them up, right? Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth was spent from the beginning among my own nation at Jerusalem, and all the Jews know. They knew me from the first, if they were willing to testify, that according to the strictness sect of our religion, I have lived a Pharisee, and now I stand, and I am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers, and to this promise our twelve tribes, especially serving God, night and day, hope to attain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. So isn't it interesting that he, he just brings this up and he says, you know, I am part of this, and he's telling his pedigree. So Agrippa is like nodding his head. He's, he knows a lot of this. So he says, uh, he says, and why, verse eight, why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? Wow. And he says, why, why should it be thought incredible? Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. Now he's giving his history. He says, but he asks this question, do you think it's incredible that God raises the dead? 
And that was, that was the argument going back and forth between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It was an ongoing discussion. Does God raise the dead or does he just let them dot, lay, lay and rot in the grave? It's going back and forth. And so the Pharisees, which Paul was, they said, no, we believe that God raises the dead and we believe in angels. We believe in all these things. And so he said, uh, so then he gives us a little history of himself, that he was an enemy of the church. He says in verse nine, again, he says, indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Now we think that, we think that Paul just was there at the death of Stephen, but no, he did a lot of this stuff. He was putting, he was breaking up families. Now he gives us a full history of, of, of Christians and putting them in jail. And then he, you know, for those who had to be put to death, he was right there voting against them. They're, because just like they voted in the Sanhedrin to kill Jesus, he put his vote. I was right there voting for him. And so uh, uh, Agrippa's like saying, hmm. And he says, and I, verse 11, and I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme, being exceedingly enraged against them. I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Think about what he was doing. This is what the Romans did to Christians, you know, years later. They would grab them, they would beat them, and they would say, renounce Jesus or we will kill you. Renounce this Jesus as Lord. If you, if you don't, we'll burn you, we'll torture you to death. And so some people were, they put the screws on their thumbs, smash them or, or beat them up or burn them alive and things like this. The, uh, there are lots of martyrs in the second, third, fourth centuries and such. And so Paul was doing that too. Now we think, wow, Paul, we should think one, the guy was bad. Paul was, he's, he's, he's being very honest and he was in, it says he was exceedingly enraged. So this is because he saw them as, the, as opposing the very thing that he loved. He saw them as enemies. He would be like, compared to the, uh, the, 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 terror, the extremist Muslims, you know, who are out there killing Christians today, uh, you know, all the bad things that they're doing, very much like him. He was a terrorist in many ways, right? And he said he would even go to foreign cities. He would go to other countries and find these people. So he says, while thus occupied as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, right? That, that these are the very people who sent him. At midday, verse 13, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And what, what is he saying here, that kicking a goat? You know, you know what a goad is, you know, it's like you're goading a cow, the what is it, a cattle prod, right? They also had goads out for, for uh, oxen, you know, that they try to kick the wagon before. And they're like pointy things, right? So it hurt. And he's telling him in essence that you're fighting against history. He's saying, Paul, you are fighting something that you can't overcome. You're kicking against the goads of history because Jesus is real. And so he says this in verse 15. So I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting me. Who are your person, I should say. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, this is interesting, and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance amongst those who are sanctified by faith in me. What's he saying? He says, he says I'm sending you to open their eyes because remember Paul, his eyes were knocked out of sight. He, God blinded him until he regained his sight after he's baptized, right? He accepted Christ. So now <clears throat> he says, your eyes, you're gonna open people's eyes and uh, you're gonna turn them from darkness, the darkness of the world to light and from the power of Satan to God. That's gonna be your job. Isn't that something? You get a job like that? And God says, here's your, oh, it's easy. Go on out there, right? And so an inheritance amongst those who are sanctified by faith. 
So he stops there and he says, okay, King Agrippa, I, I'm not, I wasn't disobedient to the heavenly vision. I declared first to those in Damascus, that was where he was going to, right? And then in Jerusalem and through all the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works befitting repentance. And for these reasons, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. So that's why I'm here. They, they're against me because, I'm, because Jesus told me to do this. Therefore, having obtained help from God to this day, I shall stand witnessing both the small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses have said would come. So he says, I'm teaching Old Testament. I'm showing people the line that leads to Christ, right? Redemption history he's teaching. Christ would suffer, that Christ would suffer, verse 23, that he would be the first to rise from the dead and would proclaim light to the Gentiles people, to the, Gen, to the Jewish people, I should say, and to the Gentiles. Now, Festus is hearing all of this, right? Uh, here, you know, here's, here's Agrippa sitting there and he's nodding his head. Festus, remember, he's the governor. He can't take it anymore. He said, Paul? You are beside yourself. Much learning is driven you mad. So in other words, you are out of your gourd, Paul. You're crazy. Because he heard about raising people from the dead. And Paul said, no, I'm not mad. Remember, mad meaning crazy. I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but I'm speaking the words of truth and reason. And, uh, and for the king before whom I also speak for you, he knows these things, right? Agrippa knows what I'm talking about. So you, Festus, you don't know. But Agrippa, you know. And for I'm convinced that none of these things escaped his attention since this thing was not done in accord. In other words, this did not happen in secret. When Jesus rose from the grave, everyone knew about it, right? It wasn't a secret. They couldn't find the body. They tried to find the body. There's no way they're proving it. You know, so of course he raised from up there. That's a great mystery of all time, right? And so everyone knew about it. And Paul turns his attention to King Agrippa. He talks to Festus over here. And he says, okay, I'm going to turn to Agrippa. And he said, Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? He said, do you, do you believe the prophets? Because all the prophets of the Old Testament are leading up. And they're very quiet. And he says, I know that you do believe. And there had to be secret. You probably could have heard, heard a pin drop because everyone's watching. Festus is watching. Uh, everybody in the crowd's watching. They want to hear what Agrippa has to say because he said, Agrippa, you know all this. And here's what Agrippa said to Paul, verse 28. You almost persuade me to become a Christian. You almost got me. Remember, remember Felix said kind of the same thing. He said, not now. <laughs> but Agrippa, he says, you almost got me. Why won't he give it up? That's interesting. Because he knew, he studied the prophets because he was king over that. He knew about these things and he said, you almost got me. What would prevent him from accepting Jesus? Well, everything, right? What would, what would be the cost? Got to give up being king or being a king and then go along and, and have the Jews hate me. You know, I'd have to change all of that. You almost persuaded me. You know, it makes me think. Yeah. It makes me think that was it he needed something more to hear? Maybe Paul stopped too short? Yeah. Or did Paul give him too much that he wasn't ready for? I wish the Bible would go a little bit deeper and say, like, well, Paul would ask him, well, why? What's, what's like you said, what's yeah. preventing you? Or what do you, what do you need more to, yeah. to convince? And in that way, we can kind of understand a little better that, Maybe it was the whole resurrection thing. Maybe yeah. he wasn't ready to hear that part yet because a lot of people get thrown off of Christianity because they're, they got, you got to take baby steps because mm -hmm. all at once it just sounds like a fairy tale. Yeah. And maybe, but then it might be that you stop too short too. Like, well, just tell me more, tell me more. Maybe he didn't get to the consequences part yet. Yeah. And I think you're right on that. You'd want to answer it, but remember the, the situation, uh, Agrippa has been put. Agrippa has been put on the spot. He's almost embarrassed now, uh, but Paul kind of nailed him at that point, 
And he says, you almost persuade me. If Paul had him in secret, let's say he had him in, 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 in one-on-one, I think Paul would have said, what's preventing you if you know these things? What, what's keeping you? Uh, but you're right, because all these people are also listening. And I think Paul Agrippa's like doing, but you're, you're right. There are people right there, and the next the, that's a perfect question. We were taught that in sales, by the way. Someone says, I don't know. You say, well, what's preventing you from making, is there something to stop? Did I not answer all your questions? Or did I tell you too much? Did I tell you too much or whatever? Was it overwhelming? Well, then Paul says this, well, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today, he must be, he's turning and looking at everybody in the room, I'm sure, that might become all, both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. He said, man, and he's in handcuffs or something. He's in chains, right? But he said, I wish you were all like me except for these chains. I wish you were all saved. And when he had said these things, the king said, okay, up, oh, gotta go, right? He stood up as well as the governor, Festus stood up. His wife, Bernice stood up. And all those commanders, all those big shots, they stood up too. And when they had gone aside and they're talking amongst themselves and uh, they were saying, this man has done nothing deserving of death or change. They're all talking amongst themselves, right? And Agrippa, he turns to Festus and he says, you know, this man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Because you know, once he said it, he's locked in. So that's it. Very interesting almost persuaded what a story so he's on his way to caesar now he's on his way to caesar and uh, fulfilling paul's dream right he he's this is what he wants to do but imagine he had this was a gospel meeting in short he had all of these people go to maybe hundreds of people there and he got to share this gospel he must have been excited about it and and to really come up to a grip and get him right there you almost got me Anyway, we will pick this up next time, chapter 27, and, um, oh, you know what we didn't? Um, do the, um, the, 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 the thing, we, we'll get the Did thing. Did in the, um, and in the, yes, you are going to say Didn't something? the Herod with John the Baptist, wasn't he almost persuaded to? Well, you're and, right. And then uh, Nicol, there was another one that said, that said that you almost, was it Nicodemus? Well, there's we, a couple other ones that were that they came close. Now, in John the Baptist's case, um, Herod didn't want to kill him. Remember, it was his uh, wife that that wanted him dead because. Um, but he would talk with John. Oh yeah, he would spend some time talking with him. But his wife wanted him dead because uh, he he embarrassed her because he she remember he called her Herod out. Herod took him. Uh, she was divorced, you know, took and stole his brother's wife, you know. But I remember another one that they were talking and talking. I think it was Nicodemus that they said you almost persuaded. Well, in Nic yeah, in Nicodemus's case, um, he kept he was he would ask this question: How can one be born again? You must be born of water and spirit. Well, eventually we know that Nicodemus was saved because um, at the at the death of Christ, he and uh, another man, Joseph of Arimathea, took the body down. And they were the one that cleansed it, prepared him for burial. So we know that he came around, but yeah, there are lots of people probably came close to that saying, I don't know, no. So I remember know. another one of your sermons that it almost, almost and they said there. it, you almost persuaded. Almost persuaded. Well, well, maybe it was the Roman, the Roman guard or something that he almost. Well, we'll, I'll tell you, we'll go, we will search that out because he's had a lot of people interested in in uh, coming to Christ. Well, we're going to sing then uh, number 31, Almost Persuaded, if you ever heard of that song before. It's a great song, and it's kind of a, a mournful song um, as you go through it. <clears throat> and uh, and they uh, actually, they, they include the words in this one, like that uh, number, six, number 31 in the songbook. Uh, they include the words of what Festus, at what Felix had said, uh, to to Paul. So we'll, we'll sing both of them. And we'll sing the whole thing, and this is what it says. Uh, almost persuaded. <laughs> almost persuaded now to believe. Almost persuaded Christ to receive. 
Seems now some soul to say, Go, Spirit, go thy way, Some more convenient day, On thee I'll call. Almost persuaded, Come, come today, Almost persuaded, turn not away. Jesus invites you here, angels are lingering near, prayers rise from hearts so dear, O wanderer, come. Almost persuaded, harvest is past. Almost persuaded, doom comes at last. Almost cannot avail, almost is but to fail. Sad, sad, that bitter will. Almost but lost. By the way, just saying, it's a great song. Mournful. But at a wedding rehearsal that I was involved in, <laughs> my wife and my own, you know, the, the chorus were singing, uh, practicing, and as Judy walked up the aisle, they sang this song, Almost Persuaded. Harvest is now to believe, almost persuaded, doom comes at last. <laughs> Like she's the black widow or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, she's, yeah, doom comes at last. Okay, so now we come to Lord's Supper. We're going to have this. If, and, of course, uh, hopefully you, you have this at home. Uh, of course, those of you who are members over here, you can always pick these up from uh, from Robert. And if you don't have it, you can always get the what, the matzo at the grocery store or, I guess, a, a saltine cracker without the salt, right? And uh, Welch's grapefruit, grapefruit, grape juice. I can't speak grape juice today. And uh, so we have this, and of course, this is to remind us of the uh, death and burial of Jesus Christ. Very precious, and we do this all the time. Of course, those of you who are watching this, probably watching this before you get to the worship, and if you choose to do this with us, that's fine. If not, you want to do it later, that's okay too, when we show our, bit, our thing later on. So uh, let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, uh, thank you so much, God, for this time, and thank you, God, uh, th to be a Christian and to accept this uh, wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul stood his ground and he spoke before the many, many people there of his great faith. That uh, he it changed him; it, it changed his life entirely. And I think I think of the verse that he wrote. In 2 Corinthians, where he says that if you are new in Christ, you're in Christ, you're a new creation, the old is, has gone and the new has come. Well, he really experienced it, God, because of you, that you, you made him different. You made him a new person. And uh, a man who at once was enraged and wanting to kill these people and is now one of them and, and went on to preach this wonderful gospel. So thank you, God, for the, the body of Christ that sustained all of those terrible beatings and hurting and and the, and the nailing to the cross that he gave this freely for us, out of love for us. And then, of course, the, the blood of Christ, which is represented by this cup that was spilled on the cross for us, that we may have eternal life. So we pray, God, for your blessings on this time as we take these two elements. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And uh, we take the, the bread. in the blood of Christ. Well, we uh, are now at the time of offering, and so, of course, if you would like to offer, you, uh, you're, you're free to mail that in to us. You get the address at the end of our our service today. Uh, also, you may donate on that donate button on there. And I know there's some people who are using that. So if you'd like to do that as well, 
and you actually get a receipt too. Right? Is that nice? So if you want to do that, that's well. But this is a good time to offer uh, our prayers for that. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you, God, for uh, the blessings that we receive. And that whatever we can give can never outweigh uh, what you've done and what you continue to do for us daily. But Father, we know that this is a, an act of faith as we give. We give believing you, trusting you, God. And we give knowing that you can do great things with what is given. So we pray for your blessings upon the gift and the giver and bless this moment. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I have another song for you. Oh. You should remind him that it's tax deductible. It is tax deductible if you're worried about that. Why did you bring up that bad memory? I, I went to my accountant this week and, and, um, and I said, it's just like getting a root canal. And she said, why do you compare me to that? And I said, well, it is. It's like getting a root canal when I see you. <laughs> anyway, okay. now we're, H60 is our song that we're going to sing. H so he is my everything. Hope you know this. Um, pretty easy to catch on. Um, um, he is my everything. So we'll go through it. And then I'm going I'm to go through the chorus here. I guess the chorus the first part. And then you go in this one part. And I'll go back through it. And I'll just, it's okay. You'll follow. You'll be all right. Uh, at 3860, <clears throat> he is my everything. <clears throat> <clears throat> he is my everything, he is my all. He is my everything, both great and small. He gave his life for me, made everything new. He is my everything. Now how about you? Some folks may ask me, some folks may say, Who is this Jesus you talk about every day? He is my Savior, He set me free. Now listen while I tell you what He means to me. He is my everything, He is my all. He is my everything, both great and small. He gave his life for me, made everything new. He is my everything, now how about you? That's a great song, it's called American Folk Melody, 1968. You went too fast, it's four over four. It's four, oh. He is my, okay. You learn something new every day. Sorry, didn't mean to shake you up there. You learn something new every day. Well, we come to the end of another time together. And then and, you forget it the next day. And I'll, <laughs> yes, I will. Where were we? Because, I, you know, I shouldn't be watching Biden on television because I'm getting some of that. You got the Biden syndrome. <laughs> I'm getting the Biden syndrome. I'm forgetting stuff. He's uh, brainwashing you. Yeah, just, yeah, he's brainwashing. It's those eyes. Well, you can hardly see them. You know. Anyway, that's another story. He won't laugh. Anyway, we'll, we'll see how he goes. Anyway, uh, our, um, we, we hope that you'll come. And by the way, we encourage you, you know, things are legal to come to worship now. And in fact, I'd like to say come Sunday morning, 10 o'clock. You know how to get here. If you don't, give us a call. Come Sunday morning. And uh, we have our worship at 10. And of course, our, our Bible class at 9 o'clock. You are welcome to come and be a part of it. We have a good time together, praying, and what else? Were you going to say something? That we was go it? eat lunch. And then go eat lunch. <laughs> it's a good time to go eat lunch. So afterwards, you know, not during, right? Well, uh, let me read this here. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are... Grateful, as always, to be here. We thank you for this marvelous story that we've read, uh, the two chapters in Acts, what they've told us about the, the courage of this man, Paul, that you have given to him, and the fact that he was able to stand and, and testify of Jesus Christ, not only to the king and the, and, the, and the governor, but all those people who are in that room. It makes me wonder... How many of those people really secretly after they left talked about this amongst themselves and how many of those people came to you, Father, and accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior? We'll never know, I guess, until we get to heaven. We'll find out there. But we do thank you, God, for this opportunity to read these things. 
thanking you, God, that you preserve these things in this wonderful book and that we may grow because of it. We pray for your blessings, Father, on those who are watching, perhaps those who are watching for the first time, that they may come to that place. May it never be that a person would say, you've almost got me there, that a person can ask the questions and and have them cleared up and, and make that decision to put Christ on in baptism. In the meantime, God, we ask for your guidance in all that we do. May this be a wonderful week that's ahead, and may worship be a wonderful experience as we come before you on Sunday. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Well, God bless you and keep you. We will see you next time.